I'm Richard Gammon, and I'm really honored to, to give you a talk. Um, you have so much, so many choices in, in this day about climate change and social justice that uh, Lynn asked me just to give you some of the update on the science. So this is really a science talk. It's not a, a values talk so much, although you'll see my values will come in. So uh, here we go. I always like to show pictures of my grandchildren because, you know, the climate change is an intergenerational issue. Maybe seven generations, maybe 70 generations. If you really look far out at some of the consequences, maybe 700 generations. It's way out there. But it's happening now already. So here's, here's my grandson Harrison on the beach in Santa Monica. Before he's grown, that beach will be underwater. It'll be gone. You like the tulips in the Skagit? The tulips will be gone. The Skagit Delta will be gone. This is what we probably have already done. And we'll talk about sea level especially because that's one of the topics where the science has moved quickly in the last five years since the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Report, which came out in 2013, based upon science up through 2012. So we're talking about five years of new science since then, okay? These international reports always lag by a year or so. They get the peer-reviewed science up to a year before, and then the report comes out, and the, and the, and the uh, uh, diplomats argue about the language of the executive summary, every, any co every comma, period, diddle and diddle has to be approved by every government of, of the whole world. So what comes out of that filter is pretty, pretty milk toast, pretty middle of the road, okay? So that, and so some extreme positions, which are possibly scientifically valid, don't appear in international reports or in national reports or in state of Washington reports from the climate impacts group, for example. So I just got back last night from Hawaii. Yes, I flew. And so my body's still in Hawaii, on Kauai, and with the plumeria and hibiscus and, uh, and ahi and, and clouds and rain and, and beautiful. So my, my mind is still there, but I have the aloha spirit. So to start, let's all, you know what aloha means? It means to share the breath. So take a deep breath and let it out. Breathe in love, breathe out hope, if that's a value. And so sharing the breath, that we all share the breath, all the planet shares the breath. And here's, as a chemist, in, in freshman chemistry, I, I teach the students that you can measure the volume of air in your lung, one breath, each breath you take, spread it around the world, and every person living anywhere, every breath they take in has some of the molecules of your last breath. It's amazing. And every breath you take has some air of every breath of every person who has ever lived. So you're connected in your breath to everyone now and everyone who's ever lived. Back to the first human, Homo sapiens, 200,000 years ago. It's just an astounding idea about the connectedness through our breath. So why am I here? I want to give you one minute about myself. Uh, I always cared about the natural world. I did uh, um, nature walks. I was in the Boy Scouts. Uh, and then I went to college and I, I became a chemistry major. And in graduate school, I studied a single molecule, carbon monoxide, one at a time as it hit the detector and studied the, this is totally basic atomic molecular physics. No, no values, no possible social application, nothing. And then my advisor said, why don't you go do uh, uh, chemistry in space? So I, I took a postdoc at Berkeley in astrochemistry. I became a cosmochemist. I was looking with radio telescopes for molecules of the origin of life and other places in the Milky Way. So also not very applied, right? And then after a year or two of that, uh, five or six years, uh, this was the ozone hole. This was this, uh, my PhD was in 1970. In this, in, during the 70s, 74, we discovered the ozone hole over the South Pole. So I, I sort of made the transition from interstellar space to stratospheric chemistry looking for freons in the stratosphere, or the breakdown products of the freons. And then later, I followed the freons as they dissolved in the ocean, and I became a chemical oceanographer, and that's when I met Dick. Mount St. Helens blew up uh, in 1980. We went on a cruise together to look at, it was called the ash cruise, look at, look at the plume of ash going down the Columbia River, and I made some measurements of chlorofluorocarbons off the coast as a function of depth in the water. So I helped establish the, the freons, the chlorofluorocarbons, as a tracer dynamical tracer of ocean circulation. That's really how I got into, uh, through the stratospheric chemistry, through the ozone hole, and then into the ocean. So when I was at the University of Washington, my appointment was in chemistry and oceanography and adjunct in atmospheric sciences. So 
And then for a while, I got to be in charge of the Global Carbon Dioxide Measurement Program for the US government in Boulder, Colorado. So from, from Barrow, Alaska to the South Pole, all their stations measuring CO2. Dave Keeling was still alive. And Noah, Noah wanted somebody in government to go to the mountain with Dave Keeling and convince Dave Keeling that, that the government could also make this measurement very well. That Dave Keeling was mortal, he was gonna die. He did die. His son is now running the network. But the NOAA measurement and the Keeling measurement still going side by side on Mauna Loa. So in 1982 to 84, I had my finger on the pulse of the planet. That's when I really got to be a carbon cycle climate change chemist. And that's still in me. Uh, and so that, that's kind of a little bit. Uh, I was helped write the first intergovernmental panel, uh, intergovernmental panel on climate change report on the carbon cycle, 1990. And so that's really my background in the science. Now, now in retirement, <coughs> I give talks like this. I try to give science updates, and occasionally I get invited to give, quote, sermons in Unitarian churches. So I do talk about values some, but this is not a values talk. This is about the science. So enough about me, about the background. Uh, the, my grandson, now these, these children I don't know, and I'll never know them. The, the older sister and the younger brother, but they matter too. We'll never know them. I don't know their names. But this, is, this problem is for them and their children as well. Uh, oh, here's Hazel, another grandchild. She's older now, but when she was about four, she said, Granddad, I know more than you. My brain is full. Whoa. OK, Hazel, wait till you're 15. Ha! Huh? Anyway, I, don't, I want Hazel never to say to me, hey, Grandpa, if you knew back then what could happen, why didn't you do more? Why didn't you do everything you could to keep us safe and keep our beautiful world? I don't want to ever hear her say that to me. So many people are motivated, including Jim Hansen, are motivated by their children, by their grandchildren, to do all we can now. We've had a good life. It's been good. What's coming in the future is going to be hard. Children born today are going to live to the end of the century. They will see some of the worst impacts of climate change. I did go to Brazil, and we saw this beautiful cat beside the river. He'd come down to drink in the afternoon. I want a world where these wild creatures will always still have a chance to be there. So climate news, some of the bad news. The good news will come later. <clears throat> record global temperatures. Uh, 2016 was a record year. I think 2017 is just going to come in right behind that. We don't have the El Nino to bump this up, but this will probably be number two. This was 2016 was warmer than 2015, which was warmer than 2014, which was warmer than 2010, which was warmer than 2005, which was warmer than 1998. These are the record global temperatures in order. We're breaking the records. Three, three years in a row, we broke the glo global temperature record. CO2 is now more than 410. The last time it was that high was more than 4 million years ago, long before the genus Homo existed, long before humans existed. That's what we've already done. This is about back when the Hawaiian Islands came up out of the ocean, OK? When North and South America joined in the Isthmus of Panama. That's what we've done to the atmosphere already, already. There's been no pause in the warming. That's a, that's a, that's a uh, denier lie. That's a lie. The warming continues. We've had record heat, rainfall, flooding, droughts, hurricanes, this year especially. I'm not going to show you pictures of the hurricanes, but you know what's been happening. I will show you a picture of the wildfires. In Christmas time, the last two years, it was way above freezing at the North Pole. I mean, Santa can, reindeer can swim, but what about Santa? Can Santa swim? The Gulf Stream is measurably slowing. That wasn't supposed to happen. The climate model said, yeah, maybe 100 years from now, there'll be a, some slight slowing of the Gulf Stream. No. We are now measuring the Gulf Stream slowing. What does that mean? Is that important? Yes. It's one of the major heat currents in the, in the northern hemisphere. It affects weather around the world. If it slows down, what happens? Sea level rise on the east coast goes up. Sea level rise, Sandy, was higher because the Gulf Stream is slowing. <coughs> Tipping points that worry me a lot. Coral bleaching. We had some terrific, horrible coral bleaching in 2014, 15, and 16 with very warm conditions. We lost a quarter of the Great Barrier Reef. If we continue, we're going to lose all the tropical coral reefs and the fish and the, and the life in the sea that goes with coral reefs. The, there are 800 million people depend upon coral reefs for their uh, fish protein. Polar ice sheets are now in irreversible collapse. We know this now. We didn't know in 2014. That's why the sea level rise prediction in that IPCC report said, well, you know, it's going to be thermal expansion and some temperate latitude glaciers. And they ignored dynamical collapse because they couldn't deal with it. Now the models are beginning to deal with it. And we're seeing these things happening in Greenland and in West Antarctica. Atmospheric methane is going up again. We don't know why. We don't know why. No, it's not fracking. 
No, it's probably not cows. It's a biological signal at low latitude. We know that from the measurements. That's a big mystery. So that's a current area of research. And the sea level rise is accelerating. Now it's about <clears throat> an inch every 10 years. What if it's an inch a year? That's 10 feet in the century. Jim Hansen thinks we're going to have multi-meter sea level rise in this century, maybe by 2050. It's not going to be three feet. It may be six feet. It may be nine feet. Each meter of sea level rise, each three feet, is 1% of the global population displaced. So we're talking about 300, 500 million people moving back from all the major cities of the coastal cities of the world. That's what we're facing in the lifetime of children born today. So this is good news, actually, the Paris Accords. But, and this, this goal was to get the carbon back in balance by the latter part of this century, again, in the lifetime of children born today. It's not in balance now. The CO2 is going up. What's going to take to stop the CO2 from going up? Stopping all emissions. And, and it stops at 550 or 600 or 650. Is that OK? No, that's not OK. You've got to get it back down. That's what 350.org means. I'm not sure we'll get back down in a reasonable time, but we've got to get back down. OK, next slide. Yeah. Go back. Oh, OK, I'll show you uh, the, 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 the uh, estimate of a global surface average annual temperature probably goes back to 1870 or so. Before that time, we didn't have a, enough of a, a global coverage to, to do that. For a, at least the last 130 years or so, we have, with increasing accuracy, average global annual surface temperature. It, that's over the ocean and over the land. OK, it was a very bad fire season. This was, in British Columbia, record. They've never had a summer forest season fire like they had this year. And that smoke, look at the smoke. Look at the smoke. You know where this fire is? Greenland. Fire in Greenland. And this is some of the location of some of the fires in the west. This was before the October fires in Napa and Sonoma. Do, did, did climate change cause this? Wrong question. Did climate change cause the hurricanes? Wrong question. If you ask Kevin Trenberth, he would say, the basic state of the atmosphere is now so different the temperature, the temperature of the ocean, which controls how much moisture is in the air. The moisture in the air controls the strength, severity, size, and longevity of hurricanes. So the basic state of the atmosphere is so different now that everything that happens in the atmosphere has a component of global climate change. You can say climate, global climate change made the fires worse, made the frequency, the, the, the severity uh, and, and longevity of the, of the hurricanes worse, made the tropical rainstorm 50 inches or more in Houston, made that worse because warmer air holds more moisture. The ocean's warmer. When it rains, it's going to rain more. That's what's happening. Did, did, it, did it cause a particular hurricane to occur? No, we can't say that. We could just say once, it, once these events happen, uh, uh, climate change, global warming, has made them more severe. Here's the fires. Here's a burn scar. Here's Napa. Here's Santa Rosa. Uh, and here's, here, further out from space, you can see the fires in Mendocino and Santa Rosa. Just one example. There were fires, uh, terrible fires in Portugal as well, other places around the world. <clears throat> so this is the last report, 2013 and 14, of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. This is the international consensus of the brightest and best climate scientists around the world. They meet, they don't do original research, they meet every five or seven years and put together a summary of the progress in climate science. And as I said, the first report was 1990, 1995, 2001, 2007, and this one. Uh, and and as, as says, these are, this document is to be policy relevant, but not policy prescriptive. It doesn't say what we're supposed to do. It says, this is the state of the science. This is what the models say is going to happen. OK, so the report that I was part of and these are the weasel words in the executive summary. It is not possible at this time to attribute all or even a large part of observed level warming to the enhanced greenhouse effect based on the current observational data. See? It says probably we can't quite see the signal yet in 1990. Five years later, the balance of evidence suggests a discernible human influence on global climate. That's the words a lawyer would use, right? Balance of evidence? That's the civil standard in the court of law. That's not the criminal standard. But Balance of evidence, better than 50-50. We think we see the signal in 1995, 2001. Most of the warming oh, is likely to have been due to greenhouse gas confidence, 66. We're now two out of three. We see the signal. Odds are two out of three, it's human activity which is causing it. This is back in 2001. 2007, notice how it's getting more 
more and more specific. 2007, most of the warming is very likely due to man-made greenhouse gases, 90%. Now we're 10 to 1, 9 to 1, that, that we see the signal, and it's due to humans. Very likely. And then the most recent report, it is extremely likely. Now these numbers are given quantitative uh, in the document, given quantitative values. So now we're 20 to 1. Now we're, now we're in conviction for murder one, right? We're, we're there. We're beyond a reasonable doubt. That's where we are in the court of law. So, and yet people don't know this. The American public doesn't know this, that the scientists are, are, are really convinced and have been for a long time that human activity is ca causing global warming through the emissions of greenhouse gases. This is a scientific fact now. The Pope knows this. So there it is again, same statement. Here, here are these likely, unlikely, more likely than not, likely, very likely, extremely likely. Here we are now. We don't go anymore. We don't go to 100%. Nothing in science is, is 100%. But we deal with uncertainty all the time in our lives. We buy insurance against the odds that you're going to have a heart attack. Your house is going to burn down. Your teenage daughter is going to wreck the car. You buy insurance against those things. We need to be buying insurance against the worst case of climate change, not the most likely case. So I have a, a brother who's a petroleum engineer in Houston. We have terrible discussions about climate change. You know somebody in your family or a neighbor who is, who, if not a denier, at least a skeptic, right? Show me the data. Okay, show them the data. This is the data. And this, is, this is your elevator talk. This is your five-minute thing. You're in the elevator with them. One, climate change is real. It's happening now. Two, we humans are causing most of the change. Three, climate scientists agree on points one and two. There is no debate. There is no debate. You can find two or three out of 100 scientists who think, oh, well, you know, it's not really proven yet, or, or you know, they're still debating it. And th most of the guys are funded by the fossil fuel industry, and they're not publishing in Nature Science environmental research letters. They're not publishing in the best journals. So the impacts are going to be very bad for people and the natural world, but there's hope to avoid the worst if we act now. As Susan Solomon said in writing this report, the impacts will be severe, pervasive, and irreversible, that's the scary one, irreversible. It's like we wait till everyone's convinced. It's OK, now what can we do about it? Sorry, guys. You want to reverse ocean acidification? Dick will tell you about that. The ocean time scale for, for reestablishing its, its, its natural alkalinity is on tens of thousands of years. You want to save a, a species from extinction or a species goes extinct? What's the, what's the time scale for evolution of new species? A million years, right? So some of what we're doing will echo down through tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of years in the future. And we'll be responsible for it. That's why we're in the Anthropocene. We're in the era where human activity is the majest, bit largest geophysical force on the planet. So people think the scientists are still arguing. It's still 50-50. It's not. It's 97 to, to 3. Uh, Stephen Colbert has a really nice piece on that. Have you seen that? He's got... He invites a, a climate skeptic on there and starts to talk and says, well, let's have the other side. And 97 scientists storm the stage. It's great. To give you a sense, I mean, there it is. There it is. And who are these three? And what are their credentials to speak on this topic? And where do they publish? Who are they? Who pays for them? Okay? So as our former head of e EPA said, human-caused climate change has now the same or more scientific certainty than the long-accepted fact that smoking cigarettes causes cancer. That's where we are. That's where the science is. The public accepts that, gee, if I smoke cigarettes three packs a day, I'm probably going to die of lung cancer. If you get that, why don't you get the, the climate science connection? It's just as strong or stronger. You're entitled to your own opinions, but not your own facts. There are no alternative facts in climate science. They're facts, and they're lies. So Americans' views, look at this. This is the Gallup poll. Uh, yes, people are getting more convinced that, that uh, they say the scientists believe global warming is occurring, and they believe global warming human, by human activity has already begun. They worry about it? Well, not so much, less than half. It's going to be a serious threat in their own lifetime? Nah, not so much, not in my lifetime. I mean, sorry, kid, we gave it a shot. We did our best, you know. Uh, this is a recent one. I, I like this. this is, uh, is climate change getting us, are we getting scared about it? In 2016 versus 17. Uh, great. Number one, corrupt government officials. That's still very popular. Terrorist attack is down. Trump care is up. Not enough money, water pollution, gun restriction, water pollution. So this is, this is the most recent one. Look, climate change has moved up to number eight. It used to be way, 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 way down here, right? Where is, where is it? 
Yeah, climate change and World War III are down there. Both climate change and World War III have moved higher in the list of concerns. Good. In a, in a global poll, who, which country, citizens of which country most accept climate change as due to human activity? China, number one. Who's last? The good old USA. We're dead last. Dead last. Who's down there with us? Great Britain, Australia? OK. That tells you something, doesn't it? Why is this? I think that, you know, there's a campaign of misinformation funded by the fossil fuel industry to confuse people, at least to say, it, maybe it's not, you know, maybe there's some connection between climate change and greenhouse gases, or maybe CO2 is, is a pollutant. I don't know. Maybe, maybe it's good for us, CO2. It's good for plants, right? So there's, there's misinformation, some of it coming from the highest levels of our government right now. I like this one, too. <clears throat> this is another global survey. 16% of the citizens of the world say, we can and we will reduce climate change. Another 40% say, well, we can and we might. We might do something. So more than half of us say, we can and we will or we might. And then they say, we could, but we're not going to. And some say, we, we can't. Give it up. We're screwed. We can't do anything. And it's not happening. So that, this is a, a sort of a, a summary of several thousand people. And, in, in major countries of the world, attitudes toward climate change. This is actually, here's 1850, 60, 70, and you just watch this curve get redder and redder up to 2010, and here's, here's the decadal average. This is from the UK Met Office to show you that we've already had almost one degree centigrade, two degrees Fahrenheit of warming as a global average already. Just watch these get redder as we go from 1850 to 1910, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. And people say, well, the models aren't really good, right? The models are not doing a good job. They are. They are. There's a hindcast, and there's a forecast, and there's the envelope, and there's the actual data. The models are doing a pretty good job of predicting global average surface temperature. So here's the actual data. <clears throat> Here was 98. And then it was warmer 2005, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, and there's the first half year of 70. So you can see the, the record that I, that I showed you in order of warmest years heading on up. And here's the CO2 to go with it. You know, we've got to bend this curve over. This curve is not, is not just going up. It's accelerating up, right? We've got to stop the acceleration, flatten it out, and then start bringing it back down. The natural world was about uh, 300 for the last 800,000 years, the warm period, and about two, uh, uh, yeah, 180 to 200 during Ice Age times. And, and as I said, no living human has ever experienced 400 parts per million. None. No, none. Back, you're back to Lucy. You're back beyond Homo erectus, Neanderthal. You're way back, way back, way back. And here's the pattern of warming over the last year. And this pattern doesn't change very much. And it's just what the models say. The models say the warming will be greater in the northern hemisphere than the southern, observed. The warming is greater at high latitude than low latitude, observed. The warming is greater on the land than over the ocean, observed. The warming is greater in the wintertime than the summertime, observed. The warming is greater at night than during the day, observed. Only greenhouse gases do this, not solar variability. Nothing else does this. This pattern is unique to greenhouse gases. That is all. How long have we known that CO2 is a greenhouse gas? 150 years. Kendall showed in laboratory measurements. CO2, methane, water vapor, ozone are greenhouse gases. Oxygen, nitrogen are not. Direct laboratory measurements 150 years ago. What the Pope said is, is wonderful words. And he didn't say this just for Catholics, OK? Human-induced climate change is a scientific reality. Is a scientific reality. And its effective control is a moral imperative for humanity. He didn't say moral imperative for good Catholics. For everybody, dealing with this problem is a moral imperative for all of us. So I don't think we have a shot at this. We might, if we have a low emission scenario, we might stop with warming under 2 degrees. But we're much more likely to be heading up to 4 degrees. This is centigrade, double that for Fahrenheit, and, and maybe even more than this, as we'll see. So one thing we don't know is, OK, let's do the experiment. Let's double CO2 in the atmosphere above the natural level and wait for the world to warm up. What is that? That's called the equilibrium climate sensitivity. And most models say it's going to be more than 2 degrees, but look at that tail. There's a long tail here. It might be 4 degrees. It might be 5 or 6 degrees. It probably is somewhere between 2 and 4 degrees. But most recent uh, uh, research, both observations and uh, modeling, suggests that the climate sensitivity is, is four degrees or more. 
So we double CO2. We go from 280 to 560. We're looking at a world with catastrophic change, 4 or 5 degrees centigrade. So <clears throat> this is from IPCC. It says this is a low emission scenario, which we're, we're not on. That's, it would be good if we got on such a track. And this is a high emission scenario. This is the one we're on. This is the changes in uh, temperature. And just look at the high emission scenario. Notice it looks just like the pattern I showed you for 2016 in, in terms of the, the spatial distribution of the warming. And this is the change in rainfall. The brown areas are drought. Are drought. Mediterranean is going to dry out more. Southern Africa, Amazon, Central America, Mexico, Australia. Uh, and more rainfall right along the equator and, and more precipitation at high latitude, but drought in the subtropics. That's in our future. That's where we're going. OK, the question first started with the discussion of climate change on Mars by Neil deGrasse Tyson, uh, and, and then came to uh, a more physiological question. What level of CO2 is, is, is direct health threat to humans? Is that right? Yeah. Well, uh, ask the astronauts, because when you live in a space capsule, you sometimes are, are not at 400. You're at 1,000 or 2,000 ppm. And direct physiological effects, confusion, et cetera, sort of sets in at one or 2,000 ppm. Uh, but that's not really our worry. We're going to have much worse uh, climate uh, and worse uh, civilization-destroying conditions if we have 500, 600, 700 ppm. So I wouldn't worry about the direct physiological uh, uh, impacts of, of CO2 at, at two or 3,000. We probably will never get there. I certainly hope not. OK, here's the carbon, this is the uh, carbon dioxide record. Here's, here's where we are now. We're at 410 and running away. Here's the depth of the last ice age. Here's the last time the Earth was warm, 110,000 years ago. And uh, notice this cycle is about every 100,000 years. So there were a couple periods back here, hundreds of thousands of years ago. Humans evolved about here, Neanderthal further back. And uh, so notice the CO2. During cold times, it's about 200. And during warm times, it's about 280. And now we're now at 410 and running away. So nothing in the last million years comes even close. We now have ice, ice core samples from 3 million years ago. What was the level? 300 ppm. So we know by direct measurements, in ice from Antarctica. It's a CO2 since before Homo sapiens arose, before the genus Homo arose, that was never higher than 300. And now we're at 410. So again, this is the, the temperature record inferred from the ice cores. And, and, and using this data, ice core data, and the correlation of the ice cores and CO2, uh, this uh, uh, publication predicts that we're headed for not two or three or four, but six degrees. Six degrees of warming for double CO2. That's catastrophic. That's civilization ending. Maybe not human species ending. I never said there won't be humans. But we will have to remake the modern world. All the coastal cities. Mass, billions of people moving from uninhabitable places to other places. Next slide. The doubling of the uh, carbon emissions. Yeah. Based upon uh, this ice core data, and the climate sensitivity that, that uh, Friedrich infers from this, he says that double CO2 by 2100 would lead to six degrees of warming. We thought it was maybe two, and we could live with that. But four is bad, and six is really bad. Are we going to run out of power, Dick? How are we doing? OK. Yeah. Yeah. From the previous slide, uh, the estimate of climate sensitivity is higher uh, using this paleo data, and that a double CO2 above the natural level, so from 280 parts per million, the pre-industrial level, to 560, which is double CO2, uh, Friedrich predicts that this would lead to a warming of 6 degrees centigrade by 2100. Now, that's, that's one extreme, but it's within, within the range, the long tail, of the climate sensitivities that I showed you. So where are we? We're already at 1 degree. What are we, what are we having already? I was just in Hawaii. I saw some coral reef damage. And I, I've been going to Hawaii for 40 years. I saw some sea level, I saw some beaches gone already. So it's already happening. If you have a memory of, of many decades, you can already see some of the changes that are occurring. So we may lose coral reefs completely. As you go from yellow to red, the damage gets worse. Mo mountain glaciers are disappearing now, even the glaciers here in the Northwest, including the glaciers on Mount Rainier, going away. Uh, maybe for a moderate warming, some high latitude regions of Canada and Russia may get higher yields of grain. Longer frost-free growing season, maybe. But pretty soon, crop yields are going to be decreasing everywhere. And the number to remember, this is Dave Battisti at the University of Washington, each one, each one degree centigrade warming reduces crop yields of, of our major staples, corn, wheat, rice, by 10 to 
So if we have three degrees of warming, 15%, that's 50% loss, half of the grain yield gone. And even the grains that grow are less nutritious. They have their C, their C to N ratio is different, okay? So we're going to have less grain and less nutritious grain in a warmer world. Maybe for Russia and Canada, a little bit good for a while, but if we're up here in three, four, five, six degrees of warming, it's going to be bad everywhere for the major food crops that we need. Uh, sea level, we're already losing uh, water availability in many places, including the Mediterranean, uh, significant droughts occurring. Uh, species extinction I didn't talk about, but a good number to have in your head is something like uh, 10 or 15 percent species extinction per degree centigrade. So if we have two or three degrees or four or five degrees of centigrade, we're, we're up there right with the great mass extinctions in the geological record when more than half of all the species went extinct. Maybe not us but half the species. You might have read in the Seattle Times about the threats to the southern resident orcas. They don't have enough king salmon anymore. And the boats are too noisy, but if they, if they don't have salmon, they will die. They won't. Yeah, Chinook salmon, king salmon. They, they, they won't eat mammals. They, need, they only eat king salmon. If they don't king salmon, there won't be any southern resident orcas. Uh, Storms, forest fires, droughts, floods, we know that's happening already. And then down here, these are, you know, there's the known knowns, the known unknowns, and the unknown unknowns. Said the Who said that? Well, Rummy, yeah, Rummy. Well, these are the unknown unknowns. Large positive feedbacks, things that we don't really know are happening, like the methane feedback, for example. So this is Lester Brown sort of saying, uh, we're, we're going from an era of abundance to one of scarcity. Food is the new oil, land is the new gold. So there are many countries in the Middle East, they can't grow any grain. The Saudis tried it, they pumped all the water out of the desert and then the uh, water's all gone. So now these countries are going elsewhere. They're buying land in other countries where they can grow the grain and send it back to their country. So people are buying up land other places where they can grow food. And water, water, water is critical, critical. So the price of grain, the price of uh, grain is going up and the stocks are going down. Okay, let's talk about sea level, because this is an area that is new since the last IPCC report. New research and very disturbing. The, uh, the IPCC uh, 2013 report said, well, you know, it depends upon the emissions, low emission scenario versus high emission scenario. We might get half a meter or at most a meter, three, uh, uh, 40 inches of sea level rise by 2100 in the lifetime of children born today. And as I said, that already displaces 1 or 2% of the global population. You can do the numbers. Take uh, 10 billion people and 1% of that, you have 100 million climate refugees just from sea level. But again, the, it, people didn't really notice. They, they said, you know, dynamical collapse of polar ice sheets, we can't deal with that. So we're not even going to include that. We're only going to talk about the thermal expansion of the, of the sea itself and maybe some temperate latitude uh, uh, melt. So this is a lower limit. And the global sea level was going up less than a meter, a millimeter per year, and then two millimeters, and two, and then now, uh, three millimeters per year is three centimeters per decade, and three centimeters is a little bit over one inch. So we're now about one inch every 10 years. And if we go, if this keeps accelerating like this, we'll soon have one inch every year. That's 100 inches in a century. Then you're talking about eight, t nine, 10 feet of sea level rise. This is a global average. Uh, and, uh, so yes, here in Washington State, uh, you can read the reports, uh, it's kind of anodyne reports. I'm, a, I'm being a little critical of the Climate Impacts Group now, uh, although Amy Stover was my former graduate student. I think that they sort of lowball it. I think they say that, uh, oh yeah, out there on the Olympic Peninsula, there, there's still a, a, a isostatic rebound from the last ice age, and there's some tectonic shifts going on because of plate tectonics. So if you go to Nia Bay, the sea level's actually falling. Falling is a measure to be falling. But I think those sort of local tectonic things are going to be completely overwhelmed by massive sea level rise of many, many. So, but for the East Coast, for, for Louisiana or for the East Coast, any place where the land is subsiding, the apparent sea level rise will be much greater. And if, 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 if in Louisiana you're taking oil and water out of, the, out, of the, out of the subsurface, there's subsidence of the land for that reason as well. So Louisiana is in big trouble. Florida is in big, big trouble. Uh, and on the East Coast, because of the Gulf Stream sort of takes a right at Cape Hatteras, if you slow down the Gulf Stream, that water slops back against the coast. So sea level rise on the east coast of the U.S. is not the global average. It's already twice the global average. So they're already at a foot or more, which made Sandy a lot worse. Uh, storm surge is, of course, whatever the local sea level rise is, storm surge is on top of that, which was one reason Sandy 
went 12 inches more into Manhattan than it would have if the sea level rise had not occurred already. Uh, storm surge, uh, the frequency and severity of, of, uh, of uh, storms, especially if they're small scale, is much harder for the models to predict. The climate models are sort of coarse resolution. And there's an effort now to sort of take these global climate models and bring them down, make finer grids that actually see the Cascades, see Whidbey Island, uh, look at uh, the, the Skagit Delta in, in more detail. So, but, but the large scale picture is clear. But when you get to smaller scale features, like tornadoes, global warming says nothing about tornadoes. They're too small. But large scale drought and heat waves, uh, thing, thing, anything that's a large scale or lasts for a long time, the climate models uh, predict those with greater confidence. Uh, okay, uh, this is just to say that the uh, Greenland ice sheet is going away. It's not going down linear. It's sort of accelerating down, right? See that? In Antarctica, accelerating down. This is the GRACE satellite data. GRACE is going to die. The satellite is going away f soon. But we're learning in great detail. This measures the mass of ice, basically. And we can tell that these are going down. And if this acceleration continues, that's the concern we have. Not just that it's going to melt, but a dynamical breakup and loss of the ice. You unplug it, and out it goes. So uh, East Antarctica, is. Uh, we think that some warm water is coming underneath the ice, and it's grounded below sea level. And if you melt that, then you take the cork out of the, cork out of the bottle, and, and the ice can, can, uh, can let go. West Antarctica would be uh, uh, three or four meters of sea level rise. Greenland by itself is six meters of sea level rise. East Antarctica, and all of the ice in the Earth melted. And we used to have, have a world like that. There were no humans then. That would be 200 feet of sea level rise, 60 meters. We could do that. So Larsen ABC, you've been watching that. We just lost another chunk of the Larsen ice shelf. There was a Pine Island glacier crack, and there it is. New Pine Island iceberg just happened. And this, island, this, uh, this particular uh, uh, glacier, here it is, the Pine Island glacier. The red means it's moving really fast. It's moving fast. And the Thwaites glacier, these are the two to watch in West Antarctica. If they both go, if they both, and, and again, they're being uh, eroded by warm water underneath them. If they bo both go, this is uh, several meters of sea level rise right there. And does that happen in a decade, or 100 years, or 200 years? Nobody knows. But we know from the geological record that rapid sea level rise is possible. We can see drowned coral reefs in the past. And sea level can come up more than an inch a year. So NOAA said, well, IPCC, you know, I think that's too conservative. We could have two meters of sea level rise. And this is a, a, a report already a couple years old. Here's a, the, the, uh, <coughs> the metric again. Each meter of sea level rise is of the order of 1% of global population. A lot of people will be moving back from a rising sea. And the good land behind them may already be taken. Your beach house in Miami, Miami Beach, you won't be able to sell it. And you cannot build a wall to keep the ocean out of Miami Beach. Why? Because it's built on, on coral. The water comes in underneath and bubbles up. You already have king tides in there. Nobody's looking 30, 40 years out. But some realtors, some realtors are starting to think that way. Just to say, where's it going to be bad? Florida, Florida, Florida is the worst. And the whole East Coast, lots of things will go underwater, Louisiana especially. We will, uh, we will lose some. As I said, we're going to lose the Skagit Delta, uh, some low-lying areas and uh, coastal areas, uh, but not as bad as California. The East Coast and the, and the Gulf Coast are where uh, sea level rise will displace uh, millions and millions of people in the United States in this century, maybe in the next few decades. Yeah, I didn't mention that. Norfolk Navy Base is at sea level. They're already building piers higher. They don't say they're doing it for sea level. They say we just need to build new piers. But that's what they're doing it for. They're flooding already. So many of our, our bases are at sea level. Uh, we're going to lose the Arctic ice pack. When was the last time we had no ice at the North Pole in the summer? Oh, three or four million years ago. What does that mean for the planet? If it's blue at the top of the world instead of white, it changes the global circulation, changes the polar jet, changes the Gulf Stream, the jet stream. So here's the ice, ice, whoa, this is Ar Arctic and Antarctic together. Suddenly, we're losing a lot of ice. We'll change the global circulation. Uh, this was last Christmas. This is a normal sort of Christmas temperature, hot in the summer and the Christmas, December, Santa Claus. But last Christmas, look at this, whoa, it never cooled off. Never cooled. Is that above freezing on Christmas Day, two years in a row? Nobody knows what this Christmas will be. 
And this has led to a theory, still a theory, of, of, of uh, polar vortex wandering, sort of these, these uh, jet stream uh, weather events which come, come across from the west to the east, they kind of get locked in and slow down. Like the rain in Houston, it just sort of, Harvey sort of sat there, right? Blocked, blocked in by two high pressures, and it rained, and it rained 52 inches, rain and rain. And then some high, some hot, and some cold conditions coming across the U.S. sort of get locked in and don't sort of move on through every three or four days like they do. They list, stay around for a week or two weeks. And some of that has to do with the temperature difference between the equator and the pole. When that temperature difference decreases, then the, 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 the winds from the west slow down, and everything gets kind of loopy and slows down. So that polar vortex. Again, still a theory, but we're seeing some evidence of that in recent weather. One way to summarize what's happening in the ocean, the oceans are growing hot, sour, and breathless. Hot, the temperature in the ocean, we can measure the ocean heat content going up. Sour, because the oceans are acidifying. Carbon dioxide plus water is carbonic acid. It's an acid gas. The oceans are measurably acidifying. And breathless because the warmer ocean holds less oxygen and is less biologically productive. So think about the future ocean as growing hot, sour, and breathless. We probably will lose most or all of the coral reefs in the lifetime, maybe in your lifetime, certainly in the lifetime of our children. And uh, as one climate scientist said, my uh, Tim Flannery said, my head tells me what my heart cannot. My beloved Great Barrier Reef is doomed. Doomed. We've already lost half the corals in the world, and 90% of the Great Barrier Reef was bleached in, in the most recent bleaching event. So bye-bye, Nemo. I mean, can you, have you ever snorkeled? Can you imagine not having a chance for your grandchildren to actually see the tropical fish? That's not a world that I want. And this is, again, that mass extinctions are happening uh, at, uh, extinctions of species are happening at, at at least 50 to 100 times the normal rate. And uh, this is the number that I gave you, that the four degrees of warming could cause extinction of more than half of the species in the world. That would make it equal to the great five extinction events in the geological record. Elizabeth Colbert wrote a book called The Sixth Extinction. So as the Beatles said, we are the walrus. We are the walrus. We are the canary in the cage. We are the consciousness of the biosphere. We, we have the power to act. I was just in Nicaragua with a group uh, bringing clean water to rural areas of Nicaragua. And we, we went over a bumpy road for about four hours and came to a town almost on the Honduran border where the Contra fight was. And this town was called Waslala. And, and, and the local office, and on, off on the wall they said, la clima está cambiando, hay que actuar. The climate is changing, we have to act. I had to go to Nicaragua to get that on the wall. What's our government doing? So mosquito-borne diseases are spreading, dengue, et cetera, chikungunya, West Nile, dengue, Zika, all of these things, frost-free conditions, the mosquitoes will move. And some, sometimes it's just the temperature itself. Degree days above 95 and deadly heat. These are two different maps. But the point is, there'll be places where you can't work outside. You can't, just can't work. And if there's no water, you won't live there. You'll go somewhere else. You will become a climate refugee. And in addition to, to sea level rise, this will cause millions of people. Where will they go? They're going to go someplace where the temperature is not so hot. Next slide. This is a prediction of drought. This is a NASA figure. This is, this is 2020. Soil moisture content, 2095. Look at that. Hey, what happens to our corn belt? What happens to all these people in Mexico and Central America? They're going to be coming up here, right? You think any wall's going to keep them out? This is one estimate of the impact of, of uh, global climate change on the economy county by county for the whole US. Some people are not going to be doing very well. Hello, Florida. And some people will actually benefit by climate change, the northernmost city. So where are these people going to go? North and west, right? Think about climate refugees within countries and between countries. Massive movements of people, hundreds of millions of people from, from, from uh, uninhabitable conditions because of temperature to sea level rise. So Cliff Mass would say, hey, not much bad's gonna happen in Washington. People are gonna come here, and they will. I already know some people who've left Arizona and come here. And of course, this is the social justice issue. Climate change and social justice, the poorest people 
will suffer the most from climate change, but they've been least responsible for causing it. They're not flying to Hawaii, excuse me. They're not, uh, they're not burning, they're not driving their SUV around. Some of them have just been around a campfire their whole life. No fossil fuel at all, and yet they will suffer the most. So this is a great intergenerational social justice issue, not just for the people suffering now, already suffering from the impacts of climate change happening today that we have caused. If you say, well, yeah, the way to think about it is take all the emissions that have ever happened from a country and divide by the population, and then it's the per person cumulative emissions, per person cumulative emissions, which make you most responsible for climate change. Who's number one? We are. We are. Number one. Oh, uh, I don't want to be too hard on the Climate Impacts Group. They've done a lot of good work. So here, there, you can just Google Climate Impacts Group, University of Washington, and get some of their reports. I'm not talking about impacts in the, in the state of Washington. This is, a, this is a more global talk. But if you want to talk about impacts in the state, and I think these are sort of toned down, I think, a little bit too anodyne in terms of the impacts. I think, at least with sea level rise, this report is uh, kind of low balls. It. So what, what do we worry about? The unknown unknowns. One of them is Arctic permafrost thaw. <laughs> if it's wet, it comes out as methane. If it's dry, it comes out as CO2. There are already some uh, worrisome methane plumes in Arctic shallow seas and on land, these big sinkholes happening in Russia and, and the Canadian Arctic already. Uh, Greenland and Western Antarctica, both are now accelerating. And, and uh, climate scientists say unstoppable. We, there's now nothing we can do to actually stop the loss, the destruction of Greenland or West Antarctica. We, what we can do, of course, is stop the emissions. And maybe that'll slow things down, give us some time to move back from the ocean. And the Gulf Stream slowing, nobody thought that would be happening, but it is already happening. There's the methane. I was in charge of this network in the early 1980s in Boulder. Some of the first data w were mine. And, and then now several groups have done this. And, and for a while in the 1990s, it kind of leveled off and said, OK, methane stopped increasing. Whoops, now it's taking off again. Why? We don't know. No, it's not, it's not leaking from frac gas. It's not, because we know the isotopic signature of the frac gas. We know the biological signature of carbon-12, carbon-13, carbon-14. We can tell from isotopes the nature of the source, even if we don't know exactly where it is. This source is low latitude, and it's a biological signal. It could be swamps. It could be rice cultivation. Maybe it's tropical cattle. I don't know. But it's not frac gas, OK? And so what happens when, when soil carbon is released, and here's the places where the soil carbon is stored, and there's a lot of it there. There's thousands of gigatons, thousands of gigatons. We release 10 gigatons a year now. There's a lot of carbon up there, frozen and in soils. And if we warm it up, it'll come out. It'll come out as methane or CO2. Here's the Atlantic Ocean. Whoa, it's slowing down. Suddenly, the, the Atlantic Ocean thermohaline circulation is slowing down. And so the water slopping up on the east coast of the US is rising higher because it no longer feels a tug to the right. It's slowing down, Coriolis effect. Uh, this, this is a temperature anomaly. They probably uh, get some uh, carbonate cores. They take core samples and date them and look at the temperature difference. And that tells them something about the speed of the current. And so the most re recent model says, well, if we continue on up with high emissions, uh, not just a little bit, the most recent models say collapse collapse of the Gulf Stream. Well, it's going to happen 300 years in the future. I don't care about that. How many generations out are we responsible for? If this happens and we could have prevented it, we're responsible. What is the Atlantic Sea? Atlantic meridional overturning. It means the water that sort of goes up in the Gulf Stream, goes off Greenland, cools, and sinks to the bottom, and comes back. So it drives the global circulation of the ocean. The time scale is 1,000 years. Atlantic meridional. Meridional. That means north-south. Atlantic meridional overturning, the overturning of the water. So in 19, meridional, meridional overturning, yeah. I, I went in the, on a ship in the North Atlantic uh, in 81, after we'd done the, the, the Mount St. Helens cruise, and, and uh, we put uh, water samplers down to the bottom, brought up the water, and measured the Freon 11 to Freon 12 ratio. Aha, that water is 1955. So by the ratio of these two freons, we could date the water in the undercurrent. So that's how I got to be a chemical oceanographer. I don't have time to go through this, but these are the bad things that will happen as we get warmer and warmer. There goes the coral reefs, right? Alpine glaciers, Arctic summer sea ice will be gone, Greenland, Western Arctic ice sheet, Amazon rainforest, boreal forest. This is the Atlantic overturnings, the Sahel, El Nino, permafrost, 
et cetera. Depending upon, here's the temperature for the last 20,000 years, and here we are now. If we followed the low emission scenario, we might just avoid most of this, maybe not the coral reefs. But we're on this track. We're on the one that's going here. And all of these things are possible. They're all possible. So we have to stop this madness before we get there. Uh, the warming has already been about one degree centigrade. That's two degrees Fahrenheit, remember? And this is how much carbon we think is in the ground. This was the, the natural level. This is what we've already done. If we stop here, we'd get two degrees of warming. But look how much carbon, especially coal, how much there is still to burn. What does it mean? It means we must never dig that up. We must never burn it. More than two-thirds, maybe 80%, it's got to stay in the ground. The industry would say that's a stranded resource. Yeah, that's right. We're going to strand it. We're going to leave it down there. Now, if you dig it up and burn it, we'll say, well, maybe we can suck it back out. Can we plant enough trees to do that? No. Can you build a machine that will suck CO2 out of the air? Yes, you can. But it's very expensive. It's very expensive. Right now, it's hundreds of dollars a ton. We can't even get a carbon tax for 20 or $30 a ton, right? There's a group, the good news, there's a group in Iceland that's just made one of these carbon sucking machines, and they put it down into the basalt, reacts with the rock, and stays there. And they say they can do it for $30 a ton. It's fantastic. If it really works, then we're going to have, I have to have millions of these machines around the world sucking back out the CO2 that we put up if we have any hope of getting from 600 back down to 300 or 350. First of all, we need to stop tropical deforestation. That's 10% of our emissions right now. Stop, trip. What do you do? You maybe pay people in the forest not to knock them down and not let the loggers come in. Pay indigenous people to protect their trees. That's a social justice issue as well. And then replant trees, reforestation and afforestation, putting trees where they weren't before, afforestation, and make the, car make the global forests a sink, a bigger sink than they are now. And beyond that, yes, maybe in the ocean, we can sprinkle the ocean with some nutrients in certain places and stimulate uh, a phy a phytoplankton growth, and some of that will sink, some of it will sink down to the bottom. I'm not so optimistic about that about uh, seeding the ocean with nutrients. I am optimistic about uh, uh, kelp in the coastal zone. Kelp would be a partial solution. OK, so maybe, maybe increasing emissions, this is where we are now, and that means the concentration is going up. That's what we measure. If we can stabilize the emissions, then the concentration still goes up, but in a linear way. If we actually get 80% reduction in the emissions, then we stabilize the concentration at maybe 600, but then we've got to get back down. We've got to get back down by 2100. That's the hope of Paris, anyway. People, what about China? What's China doing? Well, China per person, the cumulative emissions per person in China is tiny compared to ours. Per person, cumulative emissions. China is not guilty. Yes, they're emitting a lot now. And, but we're still emitting a lot. And, and it, this is the top country. So yeah, we started down about 2006. The, the Europeans started down. Where's the Europeans? EU. The Europeans started down in 1990, 15 years before us, and they're still going down. And China's going up, but they promise that they're going to peak emissions within the next 10 years and then start down. India's probably still going to go up for a while. So again, we are guilty. You can't tell the developing world, well, we burn the carbon, but you guys can't do it. That's not right. And so what's the track we're on? We're on the high emission one, the one that goes to 4 or 5 degrees C. We're on this one. We're heading up here. We want to be on this one. Notice this one, the low emission scenario that keeps us under 2 degrees goes negative. How can you go negative? You need negative emissions. How can you do that? You're going to have to plant a lot of trees. You're going to need those machines to suck out the carbon. We don't know how to do that yet. In order to get this track, we have to have neg net negative emissions later in the century. Wow. We don't know how to do that yet. And the warming goes on, goes on. It doesn't stop at 2100. The models can go on out. You see the warming goes on and on and on until we stop putting CO2 in the air and start taking it out. So as John Holdren said, we have three choices, mitigation, adaptation, and minimizing the harm. Mitigation, these, are big, these aren't big words, but you need to know what they mean. Mitigation means avoiding the change to which we cannot adapt. Adaptation means preparing for the change which we can no longer avoid. I think we're going to get two degrees no matter what. We better be ready for it. I hope we don't go to five degrees. We ought to prevent that if we can. And then minimizing human suffering and damage to the natural world. How is driving your car like mitigation or adaptation? Maybe we should do it now. Um, so uh, you tell me if it's mitigation or adaptation. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm driving at the speed limit, and I'm not drunk. Is that mitigation or adaptation? 
does it does it does it does it make does it make the damage less or does it prevent the risk of, of a bad thing happening? It prevents the risk of an accident. So that's mitigation. How about uh, seat belts? That's adaptation. Because I'm going to have a crash and I'm going to protect myself. So think about that. Try to think about adaptation versus mitigation. Think about uh, buying car insurance or life insurance uh, in, in this way. So we've never had this. Bangladesh, 140,000 deaths. Myanmar, 140,000 deaths. Senator McCain said, would a catastrophic weather event like this radically shift the US opinion on climate change? Good question. Did Hurricane Katrina do it? No. How many people died? 1,800 people died, mainly poor black people, right? How about Superstorm Sandy? Did it do it? No. European heat wave in 2003, 70,000 deaths. Russian heat wave in 2010, 70,000 deaths. They get it. Have we ever had an event in the US that killed 70,000 people? No, we haven't. What's going to be our Pearl Harbor moment? When do we say, oh, I get it. I get it. What's it going to take? I'm, I'm with John McCain. I don't know what it's going to take. Some good news. That's enough bad news, right? The good news. Solar and wind are the fastest growing, cheapest new power in the world. New contracts in India, solar and wind beats them all. Beats any new fossil fuel plant. Coal, oil, natural gas, and none of them. Solar and wind is the cheapest. We've got we to speed it up. Canada's going to have a national carbon tax. We need one, too. CO2 emissions have been flat for three years in a row, 2014, 15, 16. No increase. But wait. The measured CO2 in the atmosphere is still going up, but the global emissions are flat. What does that mean? Oh, it might mean some sort of carbon feedback from forests or soils or the ocean. Uh, also, there's an El Nino. Dick will tell you, maybe. After an El Nino, a year after the El Nino, uh, we often have a, a spurt of CO2 into the air. We just had a super big El Nino, so that could be part of it. Paris was ratified, yay, international law, holding global warming well below, those are the words, well below two degrees, maybe 1.5. I don't think we have a shot. I think that's in the rearview mirror. And our dear president has said he's going to pull us out of this bad deal. It's going to take four years to do it. I hope he won't be president by the end of that time. There's a global deal on aircraft emissions. Aircraft emissions are not, you know, it's like 3 or 5% now, but it's growing really fast. And there actually is a company now that is already making and selling an electric airplane for uh, short hauls, two or 300 miles. Electric, all electric, no fossil fuel. And some companies, even Alaska and United, are experimenting with biojet fuel. So if, there's, if you can make uh, the fuel in a carbon neutral way, then, then uh, the emissions from the aircraft do not increase atmospheric CO2. Uh, phasing out hydrofluorocarbons should help with warming. And this is really important. European Union, China, and India said, hey, no more gasoline cars, no more diesel cars. We're looking t uh, 15, 20 years out. Boom, all going to be electric. Can you, like, this is like 1890. Imagine people back then saying, gee, we're going to have horse and buggies forever, right? No, no, we won't. Are we going to have gasoline cars forever? No. This is the last generation. Our grandchildren will not be driving gasoline cars, will not be driving diesel vehicles. There's the Paris Agreement. Nicaragua is in. They just joined. Yay. The U.S. is out. So which two countries are, are not in? USA and Syria. Syria. Wow. What company we have? Now, Churchill said, now, this is not the end. It's not even the beginning of the end. But it is perhaps the end of the beginning. So we're just on the cusp of this transition to remake the modern world without fossil fuel. This is the Trump trajectory. This is the Hillary trajectory. So make global warming great again. So we don't know what our emissions are going to do. But certainly, they're not going to go down as fast as they should. What do we have to do to get down? So this is gigatons of carbon dioxide per year. So 40, we're at 40. We have to cut it in half in 10 years to 20. Cut that in half in 10 more years to 20 to 10. And cut that in half in 10 more years. Go back one more, Nick. So cut it in half, cut it in half, cut it in half. So in the, in the, in the lifetime of children born today, we have to go down by half, and that in half, and that in half. Can we do that? Can we really do that? This is like 7% uh, per year, per year, per year, for now, to 2050. And you have to end tropical deforestation. And you have to have some other source. So this is one trajectory to get us to uh, 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 carbon neutrality by 2050. And this gives us a path to a two-degree warming. That's going to be really hard. 
I'd love to see us do that. I won't be here to see it, but that's where we have to go. There's another, another view of the same thing. What sort of rate of decline we have to do in order to get down by 2050 to zero emissions? Now, this gives us a one in three chance to meet the two degree. So you're going to put your granddaughter on an airplane that has a one in three chance of crashing. No, I'm not going to do that. So two out of three is not very good odds, but this is, this is two out of three. It's two out of three probability to keep the warming under two degrees. If we want a safer world for our children, even that's not good enough. So maybe my last slide. So here's a guy up there like me. Hey, green job, liberal city, renewables, clean water, healthy children. Uh, and the guy in the back says, hey, what if it's a big hoax and we make a better world all for nothing? <laughs> so we have to deal with people like that, but we have to keep, not lose faith, not lose hope. Next slide. I'm going to end on something hopeful. Oh, what you can do. We can leave these up later. These are some things. Determine your own carbon footprint. Uh, get involved with groups like 350.org, Climate Solutions, Alliance, Citizens Climate Lobby. I just joined. This is a book on climate ethics he's reading. Uh, increase your charitable giving, international family planning, and other programs. And I like this quote from Wendell Perry. Whether we and our politicians know it or not, nature is party to all of our deals and decisions, and she has more votes, a longer memory, and a sterner sense of justice than we do. Absolutely right. Next slide. I think I'm done. Oh, I like this. We'll end with this. As, as Catherine Dean Moore said, knowing all this, how then shall we live? How then shall we live? And Naomi Klein said, this changes everything. That's the name of her book. This changes everything. And Yogi Berra said, it's getting late a lot earlier now. It's getting very late. And then I like to swallow Stevens, part of a poem. After the final no, there comes a yes. And on this yes, the future world depends. So never say nay. Always keep the yes there. And then uh, I like this quote from the Talmud. Do not be daunted by the enormity of the world's grief. Do justly now. <clears throat> Love mercy now. Walk humbly now. You are not obligated to complete the work. But neither are you free to abandon it. We can, we must, and we will. Thank you. I, I talked too long again, but I'm sure there are questions. We had some questions during the middle. Go ahead. He asked about this Atlantic meridional overturning and, the ch and changing in the temperature of the surface water near Greenland. So what's actually happening just south of Greenland, it's actually a little cold spot because the, the meltwater is coming out there. So some, some of the cold uh, uh, glacial meltwater is actually keeping a little, little, little patch of Greenland, south of Greenland in the ocean cold. Another way, and also you can sort of say normally the, the, the Gulf Stream would, would be carrying warm water up there, but since it's slowing, not as much warm water is getting up there. And all this sort of, and what normally happens is warm water goes up there, it's salty and warm, it's salty and cold, gets dense, and sinks to the bottom. And that's what drives the whole circulation. That more important than anything in Antarctica. The North Atlantic is, is the pipeline for the global circulation. Yeah, yeah I got, I, I'll repeat the question. The question was about the, uh, the, the, the wobbly polar vortex and, and whether this sort of stalling of, of weather systems. Well, uh, not the polar vortex, it's also, you know, jet stream. Yeah, down yeah, down loopy down. jet stream, loopy jet stream. And whether, whether, uh, whether this is going to become scientific uh, consensus and when. I don't know. The, the lead proponent is a woman named Jennifer Francis from Rutgers. And when I asked people in the oceanography school at UW, they said, well, it's just a theory. Luann Thompson's not convinced. So it's, it's not there yet. But things like Harvey and persistent droughts and floods and stalled high pressure and stalled low pressure, those data are accumulating. And, and looking back with models to previous stalled events, including the Russian heat wave in 2010, European heat wave in 2003, those all look like stalled events that tend to reinforce this theory. So I would predict within five years, and I'm betting on the theory, that, that actually we do know that the, the Arctic is warming relative to the equator. So this temperature gradient, which is called thermal wind equation, which drives the circulation, that has to be slowing because it, it a mechanism, right? yeah, yeah, there's a mechanism. There's reasonable physics, and, and the data are starting to support it. Yeah. No, I don't think that's possible. Uh, I'm not a physical oceanographer, but I think that the, uh, the likelihood, the Gulf Stream is measurably slowing, and uh, the recent model that I showed said it, uh, in two or 300 years could actually essentially stop. Eventually, it can re reassert itself in the same sense, but this sort of reverse circulation, maybe that happened 
you know, hundreds of millions of years ago, and there's some evidence for that, but I don't think that's in our future. Yes? Do I support methane a as a transition fuel as we leave the fossil fuel age? I do, because uh, coal burning kills six million people a year. And if any time we can shut down a coal-fired power plant in a city and burn natural gas, millions of people will live who would otherwise die. So I'm in favor of that, of methane, because it shuts down the coal industry. And once we've shut down the coal industry and we pay a carbon tax for the methane that we use, then yes, we should stop methane as well. But right now, I'm not gonna say methane's bad. Methane lasts for 10 years. After 10 years, it's CO2. So if you're, if you're a paleo guy and you're looking at the thousand year time scale, it's all CO2. Methane is nothing. Methane becomes CO2 in 10 years. It, it reacts in the atmosphere, it's burned to CO2. Sorry, your time is up. Oh, Next yeah. Okay, we're out of here. Thank you. And uh, thanks, Dick, for doing the slides.